This time we got uh, brother Derek Britt and uh, uh, Mount Zion. You know I attended Mount Zion as a little boy. Uh, my mom took me and uh, my brothers uh, to Sunday school there. And you know I, this is one thing about Sunday school. As a little lost boy, I was hoping you know they had them quarterlies with scripture in there, and the teacher would make you read the scripture. I was hoping they ran out before they got to me. I would always sit on the back row because I knew she always started on the front row reading the scripture and they go down the road and I'd say, man, I hope it's a short lesson before it gets, I can't pronounce those these and thous and those and all those names in the Bible, you know. I scared to death. But you know, I, it still, it impacts my mind even today, uh, those lessons and being in Sunday school. It makes a difference. It makes a difference. Praise the Lord for this church and what God's doing in this church. Thank you all of y'all for coming. We are really, uh, hey, you make yourself at home here. Uh, you're always welcome here. We're all part of the family of God. You all love Jesus. And uh, we lo I love you, Pastor. Uh, I said God just sort of brought us together in a couple of different occasions. And, and we just, just praised God, didn't we? We just had a good time of fellowship, praising the Lord. 
And uh, pastors need to encourage each other. We didn't just talk about numbers either. That's usually the top of the subject. But, you know, it was more than that. It was just encouraging. So I'm so thankful to have uh, Brother Derek tonight and his wife here. We're honored to have you too. Uh, so, brother, you come on and share what the Lord's laid on your heart. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. Uh, once again, I, I want to say thank you to your pastor for uh, allowing me to have this opportunity. Uh, Y'all don't know what kind of loose nut you've put behind the wheel of this thing. Uh, so, look here, y'all better just hold on. Uh, you can ask the crowd back there from Mount Zion, they'll tell you, oh yeah, you've got a loose nut behind the wheel. I don't know if you know what you, you've basically given a crazy man a loaded gun. Are you sure you this is what you want? Uh, <laughs> but tonight, as I begin to think about what I want to say, because as your pastor said, when he called me here back about coming and speaking and Every word he talked about how we had met, I remember the first time we met was at Baptist and we was in the waiting room and we had went and uh, <clears throat> we're just sitting there talking and we began to share our stories about where we had come from, where we were, uh, a little bit about our churches and some things there and we began to talk about our individual struggles. No, we didn't talk about y'all or our churches. We, we talked about us and where we struggled at, and the places the, that we felt pressure, and the, price, the places that uh, we struggled with, and, and what was going on kind of with each one. And said, hey, let's, and we, we prayed for each other, and there was just a, a bond. There was just something that happened that day when we met. Amen. That just spoke to each other. Amen. And so as I began to look at, at what I wanted to say, I didn't want to just come and just have some words that doesn't mean anything and just talk and take up time and us go home and leave. Right. I want this to be something, uh, I want it to be of God. I want it to be something that He wanted said tonight that can encourage us, that we can apply to our lives, that when we leave here, we leave change. Amen. All right? And, and there's some things you need to know about me. I am, I am crazy, okay? I, I w at times, I may tear up and cry, and that's okay. You know why? Because I, I serve a God that's a good God. You know what? He's done something in me. He's done something for me. And I, I can't help but let it out. And so tonight, I want to talk about something. I want to talk about we need to be revived. We need to be revived. And the scripture is Psalms 85. And looking at verses 4 through 7. And when I prayed about, God, what do you want me to share? I, I, I want a word that will speak to each one of us that when we leave, we leave different. And this is what he gave me. Psalms 85, verses 4 through 7. He said, Restore us again, God our Savior, and put away your displeasure toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger through all generations? Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your unfailing love, Lord, and grant us your salvation. You know, we, we think about being revived and revival and what that means. You know, we all have a thought of what revival means to us. And we all, when that word comes, you have a picture of what revival is. And so tonight I want to kind of dive into that, yeah. dive into what revival is and, and that, you know what? Tonight we need to admit that we need to be revived. Sure, yeah. sure. There needs to be, we can all say that there's a fire missing out of the church. Yes, right. That was, oh Lord. Right. Hey, right. At one time we were on fire, but now where are we? Some people think the need for revival is a sign of the moral or cultural decline of the church. And if we look at where the church is now compared to where the church once was, we see how far we've gone away from what God's pictured. Right. And yes, there's a need for revival, but revival isn't just having a revival. Right. 
We see that in the New Testament, the Old Testament, we look in church history that revivals have been a part of God's plan for the advancement of the kingdom. Amen. And this is spiritual. This is something that God's planned in. But in that revival is not just a harvest time. Think of it like this as a farmer. A farmer cannot constantly be in harvest time, can you? You couldn't withstand the strain and the pressure of constant harvest, could it? Right. It would constantly put a strain on you. Yeah. There has to be a time, you know, in farming there's a time of what? There's a time of planting. Mm -hmm. yep. And then there's a season where guess what? There's really nothing you do and then comes the harvest. Yep. Right. And revival's the same way. The revival isn't just about bringing in a harvest of the people. It's about so much more. It's not about bringing those in. It, revival is calling to us, God's people, that it's time for a change in us. Right. That there's got to be a stirring done in, inside of us. Right. What many people call revivals are not revivals at all. You've heard of, of revivals and been part of revivals, I'm sure, over the years where there was great singing and there was great preaching. But after that, there was few if any, noticeable changes. Right, yeah, you're right. we, I mean, if we go, let's be honest tonight, all right? That, that's the one thing I ask. And I want you to do that right now. I want you to give yourself permission tonight to be honest yeah. and true. Okay? Because if we're not going to be that, we just need to stop right now. Right. And just cut the lights off and head on to the house. Because there, there's not going to be any change until we're ready to be real. Right? When we get real, that's when God... He, will, he gets real with us then. Amen. And that's all he wants. And so we've all been parts of revival where we went, and oh, there would be great singing or great preaching. But after the revival was over, there was no change. Yeah. Everything went back to the way it was right. with no noticeable results. And we see that these means are not revivals. They may be extended seasons of maybe singing and preaching, and that's all. When we have true revival, revival is real. Yeah. You don't have to be told that you went to revival. You leave changed. You know it. You know that. You know what? I met God tonight. Amen. And there was a change in me. There's been something that's happened. You don't have to be told. You know it. You were there. You were part of it. You know when you leave that, you know what? I left changed. Amen. It's been a true, there was a true meeting. It was a revival. You know what? It, the word for being revived means it means you're taking something dead and you bring it back to life. Right. Amen. And too many of us are walking through this life right now spiritually dead. Yeah. Yeah. We're just going through the motions, playing church, because we, we come, we dress up, we, we got our hair uh, dyed, dried, laid to the side, fixed up with our suit or our clothes on. And we come in, we play church, we come in and we say the lingo that we're supposed to say. Amen, brother, thank right. you, I praise God. And you know what? There's nothing behind the words at all. Yeah. Right. We, play the, we play the church part, we yeah. come in, all like, man, we're on fire for God. There ain't been a fire in us in so long. It, it's right. ungone. It, it's, that fire's been quenched long ago. And we, right. and we leave this place no different than what we came. And we go back into the world. And really, the world can't tell any difference between us and the rest of the world. Yeah, right. yeah. And it's time for us to, to be revived. It's time to come back to life. We need more than just mere preaching. Right. You know what we need? We need a visitation yeah. from the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Amen. If we want to really make an impact in our communities, if we really want to reach people for God... We need a visitation. Amen. Amen. And that's what revival is about. We want something that will make people know that there's a God in heaven, that the Bible is His Word, that the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ. A real revival does this. It shakes, it breaks, it melts, it molds, and it causes the power of God to flow over the hearts of His people. Amen. And we should want revival. That's, right. That's what we should want, that we should be wanting. And yes, let me tell you, being shaken and broken and molded, that hurts. Yes. And that's why most of us don't want revival. Yes. 
Because we don't want to be shaken. We don't want to be broken because being broken hurts. Because we don't like that. We don't Because it, it causes us to get brutally honest with God. And sometimes that means pointing out some things that we don't want necessarily changed in our lives. Oh, wait a minute, Pastor. You don't. Oh, yeah. Guess what? Yeah. There's things in your life that he wants to take other stuff in mind. That he's, guess what? I'm not perfect. I'm far from it. There's, guess what? He's still working on me. There's still, <laughs> my wife, could, you could have amen. It would have been all right. They would have, they, I see you, I know you back there got me. That, you know what? There's things that he's wanting to do in us, it, it, that he's wanting to break out of us, that he's wanting to shake you and, and, and bring you back to life. He's wanting to get rid of some things. He wants huh, you to get real with him. God is ready to give it, and he wants us to have it. He'll give us the kind of victory the minute we make room for it. So how do we make room for that? How do we, we get that revived? How do we get this to this point in, in our present condition that we can move beyond this pressing problem, that we move to the point of being ready to be broken, to be molded? Let us consider this. Let's look at the purpose of a revival. And, and, and how we need revival and the price of revival. The first thing we look at, the first purpose of a revival is to expose sin in the hearts and lives of God's people. Amen. And in the hearts and lives of the unsaved. You see how in that, it didn't say that I looked at the sins in the unsaved first. No, it said first we looked at the sins of God's people. Right. And we expose that. And we get rid of the junk that's in. How am I going to reach that world out there mm -hmm. if I'm toting the same junk they are? Mm -hmm. right. If I look no different, right. how am I going to draw? How are we, any of us going to draw them in right. if we look the same? Right. Amen. If you walk around... Uh, Go ahead. Go ahead, man. If you walk around mad, angry, sour yeah. face like you just sucked a lemon, how's that going to make yeah. anybody want anything that you got? You're right. Right. When you get to talking about God, they're going to look at you and go, man, if that's the kind of face it causes, or if, that, if your actions yeah. are what it is, I don't want nothing to do Amen. with that. Amen. That's right. And so that's where revival starts. It, it starts in us. Amen. And we can't, you know, we all think revival is the preacher. No, it ain't the preacher. It's you. It's Amen. me. Amen. It's out here. When the hearts out here begin to be stirred and changed, that's when revival begins. Because guess what? Revival starts before you ever walk in the door. Before you ever come to that meeting. It, it, he's begun to do something in you. Right. It may be on the ride. You may be going down the road and the ride over and a song comes on and you just begin to cry because it takes you back to a place that you remember your story and, and you remember like Pastor talked about that time when you were over here and how God brought you from there to there yeah. and it begins to stir something inside of you. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we need. Hey. We need that. We need to know <clears throat> that revival is to expose the sin in our hearts and in our lives. And then as it's exposed and oh, he begins to work in it. We can reach out to the unsaved. Yeah. You know what? Mm. Without me telling you, you know, when a, when a workman goes to, to build a, a giant skyscraper, the higher they go, the deeper they must go. As the walls go higher, the basement and the sub-basement has to go deeper to be able to withstand it. The same is true for revival. To build a structure for the glory of God and the salvation of the lost, you must dig and blast and carry away all the things which might hinder the progress. Right. Right. I can say by experience, thank God, that you know what? When we get to that point, that He'll begin to uh, dig and blast and carry away. Amen. That yeah. that we don't need, so that guess what, the digging can happen, so that things can, the progress is not hindered. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. That in revival we want to bring people to to the realization of their sins, and that revival isn't just a religious word or religion, or it's not just. It's not just about religion. It's not. It's about a. Uh, 
It's about a relationship. It's not knowing the words. It's not knowing the lingo. But it's about having a relationship with Christ. And being real. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You know, we, we look at the world that we're in right now. And there's been... There's never been so much uh, evil and corruption as we see now. Uh, We see things, uh, 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 drinking, adultery. And everywhere that we see, we see immorality, indecency. And it just seems to be running rampant. Around us, right. it seems to be there's no change in time. You know, I, I we, I'm sure you're like me. At times, you sit there and pray, God, where are you at? Why, why, why is this thing? Why are these going on? What you have to see this happening? What, why, what's, why are you allowing such to to go? How we need to we see the the rottenness, the evil, the corruption in the hearts of people. It seems we go day after day, month after month, year after year. In the even or uneven tenor of our ways, sin becomes so common. It becomes so prevalent that you know what begins to happen? We don't pay attention to it anymore. Because we get used to seeing it around us and we just think. And so it just becomes another thing. It's all... I mean, how how many of us become jaded like that? That we just see it and we think, uh... Not such a shocker anymore. You know, you right. turn on the news and see where somebody's been murdered. We can flip it on now. Nah. You can flip the channel right on to something else. It don't even phase you. Right. Don't even think twice true. about what. That's true. And before, used to, years ago, you'd hear something like that. You'd be tuned in trying to find out all you could what's happening. Sin's become, it's just become so rampant in the world that you know what? If we're not careful as Christians, if we're not awakened to it, that guess what? We're lulled into sleep. And that sin creeps in. And we're not even being shaken by it. We're not even aware. We're just, we're in a place that you know what? Ah, It's okay. It's not that rotten. You know, we, things are fine. It isn't that bad. And we pay no attention to it. You know, we, we, everybody seems to, to go on their own life. And our minds are lulled to sleep by Satan. Amen. The enemy. Because that's, right. that's what he wants. Yeah. He wants you to be asleep behind the wheel. Right. Yeah. He don't want you paying attention. Because guess what? If you're asleep behind the wheel, he's got control. And that's the problem. Too many of us are walking through this life on on spiritual cruise control. Yeah. Yeah. And things are flying by us and we ain't paying a bit of t- you know, go you go on a long trip in the car. You go, man, that cruise control is great, ain't it? You set the cruise, you take your foot, just sit back, you and now car the newer cars are getting to the point now, you ain't even got to steer them hard. They got the right. sensors and control, you just you're just there riding along. Guess what? For us in our spiritual life, that's the way a lot of us are living. Yeah. Yeah. We've got the cruise set and we're not involved in anything in our life. We're just riding along, things are zipping by, and we're not even paying attention. Right. And we're missing opportunities that God's placing in our paths Amen. to make a difference. Amen. But we're too busy on in our spiritual cruise control. It's time to hey, you need to flip that switch off for a minute. Amen. Take control back for and guess what? See what God wants to do. It, it, we can't let Satan lull us to sleep. That's what he wants. He wants to stop a movement of God. Amen. You know what? You know what we've done? <clears throat> we've, be- we've grown. Huh. We've grown fat and lazy mm-hmm. at our spiritual souls. And no, I'm not talking about your physical body because I, I ain't got no room to talk about it. I'm. Uh, I've got. Uh, the, the, this pandemic and all this mess has been terrible. Uh, I believe we've all probably can come away and say we've gained 10 pounds from a pandemic. But I'm not talking about our physical body. I'm talking about your spiritual body. It's growing fat and lazy. We love to hear soft 
warm, perfumed excuses of, of why we don't have to do things or, or, or this is okay. Oh, yeah. We need to, right. we, right. that it's all right. Oh, it's okay that, that you've done that. It's, that sins, oh, that's not that bad. It's okay. You're, right. you're, you're, you're right. not that bad. Right. Oh, it's, it, look, it, it, it's okay. Look, everybody understands. <laughs> and we've become to the point that, that, you know what? That's what our ears want to hear. Yeah. 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 You're right. yeah. And if we look in Scripture, it, it warns us. Mm -hmm. I believe I believe it tells us that in the last days that that's what we'll see. That's right. That we'll want those things. We'll want to hear those. Oh, yeah. right, we'll want to hear those things. We want you to pat me on the back and tell me, oh, I'm okay. Everything's all right. You're good. Yeah. Don't worry. That's Don't right. worry. Mm -hmm. And guess what? That's not... Hmm. That's not the word we need to hear. Amen. You know what Amen. we need? To, we, we need to be. You need. Uh, you need your toes stepped on. Yeah. I need my toes stepped on. I need to be wakened up every once in a while. I need to be shaking and say, "Hey, are you where you need to be? Are you doing the things you need to do?" Yeah. And today, that's what he sent me to do. He sent. Uh, he sent this high pitched, loud hick. <laughs> <laughs> To get loud with you, to maybe shake you tonight and wake you up. Amen. And give you a word that wakes you up and says, Hey, quit riding in cruise control anymore. Amen. It's time to see. Amen. Look, I'm wanting to do something in you yeah. and yeah. through you if you'll wake up Amen. and come to life. Amen. Amen. You want to, your church, you want to make an impact in this community? Then you come to life. Amen. Amen. You begin to serve God, uh, and you watch what begins to happen. We need a shock of, of terrific dynamite to blast us out of the rut into which the devil's thrown us into. Right. Amen. The only kind of explosion that accomplishes this is a Holy Ghost revival. Amen. Yeah. That's Amen. what shakes us. That's what shakes us into being alive again. The second purpose of a revival is to enlist souls. First, we must seek to enlist God's people and then to go after the lost. Why are our churches half empty? Why do not souls come to Christ? Because Christians are not sufficiently concerned about the work of the Lord. And I know that's a hard word. And it's not easy for us sometimes to hear those words because, man, you're being harsh on us. And yes, I am being harsh on you. And I am being. But you know what? There's a reason. And here's my thought on that. I don't want... One day, we're all going to sit before God in a judgment seat. And I don't know what that looks. And for a minute, we're just going to go... This is in the Bible. This is just Derek's. Okay? And I don't want you to be sitting and, or me to be sitting there in front of him. And I picture uh, this, that he's going through my life. And we're looking at things. And as he goes, he shows me a glimpse of, look, I had you here. I give you an opportunity. Why didn't you, why didn't you take it? You could have spoke to, look, this person, you could have poured into their life here. You could have spoke, look, I placed you over here for this reason. Yeah. And you did nothing. Right. Why? No, and I think how that would tear my heart. And I don't want... Uh, my. If I can stomp your toes now to warn you, to prevent you, so that, that you don't have a day where you go, you're sitting before a, God, a holy God, and He says, look, I placed you here, and you didn't take full advantage of the opportunity I give you. I placed you over here to do this, and you missed it. Why? And I think how it would break my heart. And so if I got to shake you today to get you to see what you need to do, that's what I'm here for. Because as Christians, we're not concerned enough about the work of God. We're not concerned about the lost. We've lost that desire to reach out to a lost world. It, is, it used to be a burden that the church carried, but now it's just been kind of thrown to the side. It's one of the side works that we do also. We've become more about patting each other on the back and giving each other, oh, you, you're doing good and, and, and making everybody comfortable. We've, <laughs> yeah. 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 In the church in America, we are the most babied yeah. and comforted people. We get mad 
and ticked off if the heat ain't hot enough, if the air ain't cold enough, if we don't, if the bathrooms aren't clean enough, if the carpet ain't nice enough, if we don't have coffee, if we don't have snacks, we don't have this for the kids, you're mad and, and well, I'm going to go over here. I go, look, we're so pampered. Yeah. We're worried about all that and we're not worried about those that are, come on now. Come on. Yeah, come on. That are out there that are what? Bound up in sin and going to hell. Right. And we're too worried about the carpet and the seats that we sit in and if we've got coffee to drink and is the air cool enough? Is it hot enough? And we need to be less worried about our comforts and more worried about the lost souls. Amen. The man and the woman and the family that's bound up in sin yeah. out here going to hell. Amen. Yeah. That we're within a hundred foot of being able to reach. Yeah. Right. Right. And we don't want to walk out of our comfort zone to reach them. Amen. Lord help us. Amen. Yes. We need we need that stirring inside that comes from revival that reminds us that as Christians we need to be concerned about the work of the Lord. Amen. That we have to enlist God's people. Do you know God has put y'all together? Do you know that God's put this church and put the people that are in this church for a time such as this? Right. You know, I've told our church that you know each one that's there has been put in this time for a time such as this with the talents and stuff they have that we can come together corporately and reach the community around us. Amen. That each one of us has a talent or a skill or something that you're here for. Mm -hmm. And God wants to use you, whatever that is. If your skill, you know what, if your skill is cleaning toilets, mm. amen. Look, that's a gifting. He's given you, because guess what? That's one thing. If you're, yours is being able to work on stuff or, or, or build things or what, get, he gives you a mechanical mind. He's got you there for a reason. If it's being able to work on a vehicle, then he's got you there. If it's working in a yard, if it's building, construction, whatever it is, he has you here for a reason. He's placed you here so that you can use that. He wants to enlist his people. You know, it's not just... The pastors that are going to call them. It's not the pastors going to say, you know, I, I think uh, that God is showing me that, you know what, in these last days, you know what, if you're wanting to reach people, it's not the pastor, it's y'all. Right, right. It's the congregation. Because guess what? Way too many people have been hurt by church that, you know what, they're never going to down the doorstep on the, on the church grounds whatsoever because they've been hurt. You know, we, we've all heard it. We're all, what? You know, uh, if you ain't heard this before, I'm going to tell you right now, guess what? We're all a bunch of hypocrites. Yeah. Yeah. We've all heard it. That that's all church is. That's why I don't come to church. It's full of hypocrites. Yeah. Yeah. Well, guess what? I can't think of a better place for a bunch of hypocrites to be in. Because maybe, maybe at some point you'll be changed and you won't be a hypocrite anymore. Right, right. Oh, thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord. It is time that, you know what? You use those things, those skills that God's given you. Guess what? He may take huh, you out here working on somebody's lawnmower. And in that, it stirs the conversation up. And you begin to talk about God. And you can speak more than your pastor could ever speak. Amen. Or it may be you stopping and, and, and helping somebody. You go and, and, and build a deck or do something for someone. And in that time that you're there, mow a yard, what, whatever it is, guess what? God will use that. It may be at your workplace that He uses you. Amen. That there's ones, you know what? You, each one of us has a, a group of people that, guess what? We can speak to. That they're going to listen to you that, guess what? No one else may be able to reach. Whether that be people at work, whether that be family, that guess what? A pastor may not ever be able to reach, but you could reach. That's right. And here's what I want to, tonight I want to tell you. You know what? For some of you, you may be the only God that some people see. Mm -hmm. yes, sir. How much of it is He seeing in you? How much of it is, are they seeing? Are they seeing Jesus Christ? In the way you walk, in the way you talk, do they see Christ? Or are they going... Mm, I don't know if it's Christ I'm seeing in him. Look, revival is about stirring up something inside of us. 
It's about that we, we, we see that, you know what, God's, God's done something inside of us. He, he's, uh, we've been born again. We've been washed in the blood. We've been regenerated. You know, the, the Holy Spirit's come in and, and is doing a work inside of us. And, and if we claim the Lord is our personal Savior. You know, He's beginning to do something inside. He's beginning to clean us up. And, and in that, you know what? It's time for us to do something. Amen. Our job in the church is not to sit on the pews. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. And when the offering plate comes around, throw maybe a little something in there and say we've done our duty for the week. No. There's so much more. Amen. There's so much more that has to be done. He doesn't. He he expects more of you. If that's all you think, guess what? I'm here to tell you, boy, you're you're missing something. Mm -hmm. You're missing an awesome experience. Because guess what? When you get involved, and God says, "Hey, come on, I I want to use you," and you let Him use you, you better be ready for the ride that He's going to do. Because I'm going to tell you right now, you don't know where He's going to take you. Amen. I'm living. <laughs> I'm living proof of that. If you'd have told me 15 years ago that on Sunday night I'd be here speaking at a church, I'd, I'd told you he's crazy. Amen. Amen. I'd told you there's no way. Uh, I thought my career, I thought my path was chosen. Uh, I was a firefighter for the city of Asheboro. Uh, had been, I thought that was, that was my life's dream from the time I was a child. And that I thought that that was what God had for me. He placed me there. Uh, he opened doors that it truly was His uh, that He opened for me to be able to, to move up. And I thought that, man, this is where God's got me. I, I, he opened the door where I could do this. I was able to do, uh, I'd done ministry along the way too. I, I got to be an associate pastor. I think, man, you know, some people uh, are lucky if they find and get to do one love in their life. God blessed me and gave me the ability and the chance to do two of my loves. I got to, to be a fireman and I also got to serve God. And I thought, man, this is what it's going to be. He's going to take me to retirement. And then at retirement, I, you know, I'm going to be set. I'll still be young. I can, and I can go into ministry then and do something. And guess what? God said, no, that's, that's, that's not my plan. That's not what I have for you at all. And so at 15 years in, God says, uh, I want you to go a different route altogether. And I want you to go into ministry full time. And I'm going to tell you, I remember praying a prayer one. It was in January. And uh, work for the last several months had been miserable. For the first time in, in 15 years, I... I hated my job. You can ask my wife. I never hated I loved my job. I loved going in every morning. I enjoyed the things I got to do. Man, it, uh, God opened doors and allowed me to do some things and meet some awesome people that I loved. I loved being able to get out and see different people in the community. And for the first time in that 15 years, I hated, I hated getting up and going to work. And I remember walking down the hallway uh, of our house, and I was praying, and I said, God, if you're doing this to get me uncomfortable so that I'll leave, then show me that's what you want. Or, if not, then I want you to open the door that I have the ability to change the things that are bad at work, that I can do something there. So, you, God, it's, it's in you. If, if you're doing this to make me uncomfortable so I'll move, then move. But I want you to show me. And I thought, I remember praying that prayer that, that morning, walking down the hall, and after that prayer, you know, how many of us, after we pray, we, we, you know, we think, well, all right, God, I'll give you about 30 minutes. About time to, about time to hear something, ain't it? Yeah, you, you ain't supposed to. 30 minutes is plenty of time, right? That, that's plenty of time for you to answer. That, that's because, you know, you tell, tell us that, that uh, <laughs> I mean, it's like an hour. So, look, I give you 30. So, I give you like 30 minutes. That's 30 hours. So, you should have something worked out by now for me. And he said, no, there's nothing. And so... I went three months, and one morning, 
I didn't really, I hadn't thought about that prayer again. And, and three months later, I was on my way to work and I get a phone call uh, from a pastor friend of mine that said, uh, it was actually my pastor that, that uh, said, hey, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm going down the road headed to work. Why? He said, well, I want to know something. I said, okay. And he said, I think you're ready. Um, I think you're ready. If you would be ready and uh, if you want to step out and take a church, I think you're at that point. And before I offer or tell anybody that you are, I want to make sure that's the way you want to go. Is God calling you to that? And I said, <laughs> I said, well, let me tell you something. About three months ago, I prayed a prayer, and absolutely. He said, okay, well, there's no guarantees or anything. I just want to see. All right, that's at 730. At 11 o'clock, I get a phone call. Hey, uh, we've got a couple of churches we think we'd like for you to look at. By 1 o'clock, can you send us a couple of resumes, and is there any video of you? Sure. By 5 o'clock, you may be contacted by a couple. Just be ready. God, he began to move. He began, and, and what my plan, I thought had been God changed dramatically. Yeah. Huh. But you know what it started with? It started with me saying, God, it's not me, it's you. Right. Right. It's not me, it's not what I want, because mm -hmm. I'd rather stayed where I was at. That'd be, it was easy. Guess what? I had another... Ten years, and I could sit on Easy Street, wait for the mailman to bring the check. We were going to go camping, doing all kinds of things. God said, no, that's not the path I have for you. You know what? I don't know what path he has for you, but you know what? He's calling you to something. He's wanting to enlist you into his army to reach the unsaved, to bring them out of darkness into light. To lead them from heaven, from hell to heaven, That's right. from sin to salvation, That's right. hmm. from iniquity to righteousness, Amen. Amen. <laughs> we must win them for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The majority of people who have been saved since the beginning of Christianity have been reached and enlisted and brought during some type of revival. The majority of those who will be saved in this will be by grace, will be reached for Christ during revival. Revival isn't the meeting. The revival is the change in you. Amen. You want to reach people? Become re oh. The third purpose of revival, maybe the chief purpose the noblest motive, the highest passion, the only purpose God can really, is that God will bless. God has blessed us that, you know what it is for revival? It is to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what revival, that, that's all it is. Amen. It's about exalting the name of Christ. It's all about Him. And I'm afraid that maybe one, if not the biggest reason why God is not blessing our efforts more is that we're selfish. Sure. That we've not thought of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. That we're making it about self. Right. Right. That's why many of us are not doing anything. Right. Many of us are not in love with Jesus. Right. We have no compassion for the lost. Right. Mm -hmm. We work for each other, mm -hmm. for the church, for the pastor, but not for the lost. And the least little thing that comes along in our life throws us off balance and turns us topsy-turvy into a twist and a storm. If we're in love 
with Christ. If we're in love with Jesus, we have a passion for Him. No matter what the difficulty, no matter what anybody else does, our passion for Christ will drive us to give, to pray, to do. Amen. We need to exalt Amen. Christ. Amen. We need to exalt that name. It's no longer about us and our comfort, but about Him. Amen. Amen. It's not... Uh, it's about drawing all, huh, all unto Him. That's right. Amen. That's right. And the only way that we can do this hmm, is by exalting the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And it starts, hmm, and it starts with the simplest of things. Yeah. Pastor talked about it starts at home. Do you, do you exalt the name of Christ at home? Do you let your children? Are you, are you leading by the by example? So much of, uh, of the trouble that we see the church is in is because our homes are in shambles. We've not, uh, and men, I'm gonna. Look here, I'm going to hang this on us, okay? Because it is. Yes. We're called to be the spiritual leaders of our home. Yes. And for way too long, we've not been. Amen. Right. Amen. Right. And for years and years, ladies, the church has been carried on your backs. Yeah, right. Because men had not been what they're supposed to be. That's right. They've been weak. We've been weak. We've been cowards. And women have had to take that role right. and that responsibility. And you know what? Some of the mess that we're in is because we as men haven't been the men we need to be. Sure. Right. And God's calling us, hey, it's time to step up. That's right. It's time to be a man. It's time to take control in your home. Yeah. Guess what? If you want to see your children, if you want godly children, then you need to lead by example. Right. They need to see, because guess what? I have, a, I have a son that, guess what? The example of Christ he's seen is going to be me. Yeah. And I Man. want him to see <laughs> yeah. a daddy that's led by God. Amen. Yeah. Amen. That you know what the decisions I make are led, I'm led by God. Amen. That he sees a, a daddy that, guess what? Boy, ain't God always got all the answers. Right. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know what? All I can do is fall and pray. Right. That's right. That's right. And then he understands the, the power of prayer. And I want to tell you, you want to you wanna see change in your family? Begin to pray as a family. Right. One simple act. Look, I, I'm going to challenge you to do this. At night. And this is... We started uh, with, with our son when he was little, little. We would go at night. And we'd take, and before we went to bed, we'd go in there, let's, get, let's say our prayers. And, and we started it off with, with me and my wife would pray. One would pray and then the other. And then as he got older, all right, you pray. And that would became our thing every night. And let me tell you something. If you'll do that, you won't see some change in your family. Come together and pray. That few minutes. Don't take long. But it will change your family Amen. forever. Amen. And it starts huh, with just little things like that. If you begin to... Oh, b men, be the men they're supposed to be. Lead your homes. Hmm. Pray. Kinda, uh, let God do a work. Let Him stir inside. As you start to do it, look, as He starts to, to bring your family together and mend that and strengthen it, guess what? It'll, it'll branch out. It'll go from your home to when you're at work. And let me tell you, God will open up doors there that, guess what? 
people that you never thought you would be able to speak and talk about Christ to will be drawn to you because they'll see something different going on. They'll, be, they'll see something. They'll go, there's something different in you. And you ain't got to tell them. You don't have to do anything. But just walk it. Let them see the love of Christ in you. Right. Just walk it. It's not about talking. Sometimes it's just about walking. Well, you ain't got to. You want, you want to lead somebody to Christ? Sometimes you won't have to say much at all. They just see your walk. And in seeing your walk, it draws them to you. And the next thing, why are you different? You used to act like this. I used to see you would have. Boy, you handled that situation completely different. Why? And it opens a door that you can say, this is why. Because of what God did in my life. Consider all the persons, all the people that you can think of that need to be changed, that need to change, that need to be revived. Think about that. Think about those that are hurting, that are lost. No, oh, thank you. Think of those that need to be reached. In revival, there's some important things that must be involved. God has to be involved. The Holy Spirit. We can't do these. We can't do revival in our own strength. It has to be God's strength. We can't do the things that we can't go and visit ever or advertise or, or uh, tell people ten services or, or do this without people without being led by the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to convict people, to, to, to reach their hearts. Lord, that, that when we go out and, and say, come, that He begins to pull on their hearts. He begins to bring them in. He begins to, uh, through that Holy Spirit, even before you speak, He begins to do a work inside that heart. He begins to change Oh, thank you, Lord. Amen. This Holy Spirit's eager, it's longing, and it's able to move if we will but give Him the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Revival involves the church and its members. It involves Christians. It involves you and me. Let me tell you something. If you give me 300 people dedicated to God, surrendered to Christ, submitted to the Holy Spirit, who will say, you can count on me. E even if we drop that number to 200, who will go the limit for Jesus, for the gospel, and the Holy Spirit, for the souls of men, guess what? We can take the city by storm. For the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. Right. You know, that there is only one unknown equation in a revival. Only one thing that can stop us from having victory. Only one thing that will keep God from giving us a revival. Do you know what that is? You know what the one thing that will stop revival? Look in the mirror. There between the frames of the mirror, you'll see the only thing that can stop us from having a spiritual bringing back to life Amen. is that person staring back in the mirror. God's ready, He's willing, and He's able to bless. Christ will deny us no good thing. Hmm. A revival is, it is about unsaved souls. It's about backsliders, those out of Christ for any reason. If we pray for them, if we go after them, they will come. It's been seen everywhere. But they will not come unless we go after them. Amen. We've heard people say that, that in olden times sinners came to church and that's... That, that may be true, but guess what? The Lord Jesus went after. Right. We see in Scripture, He didn't beckon them to Him. He didn't go and say, hey, I'm having a meeting over here. Y'all need to come. What did He do? He walked with them. He went to them. 
He sent His disciples after Him. It's always been difficult to reach the lost. They never come necessarily on their own because the devil has them and he don't want to cut loose of them. He has power over them and he has hold and he doesn't want to let go. He doesn't want them to find freedom. He doesn't want them to find victory. He doesn't want them hmm. He doesn't want them to be cut loose from those chains that have them down. He wants to keep them exactly where they're at. But Christ, in His compassion, in His intercession, in His huh, loving way, has come to set them free. Amen. If we'll set Him free. So what is the price for revival? What's the price that we pay? What, what is it? What price did Peter and Paul, Luther, Wesley, Whitefield, Spurgeon have to pay to see these great revivals? Each of us have to pay the same price, the exact same price. There's no difference. There, there never will be any difference. God has never changed His terms. His power is costly. The most, ex the most expensive power in all the world is is the power of Pentecost. And the price is high, but we can pay it. Here's how. We must, we must, understand this, we must have a personal devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We must have a personal devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. If you read the biography of these men that I've mentioned that, that have had these, that held these great revivals, you'll find that they were characterized by one outstanding attitude. They were in love with the Lord. Amen. You and I must fall in love with Jesus. Passion and devotion to Christ will take care of the sin problem in our lives. Amen. Amen. If we love Jesus... We will hate the devil, we'll hate the world, and we'll hate sin, and we'll see sin for what it really is. Right. Right. To me, if that's the problem, we don't see sin the way God sees it. Right. But if we'll really fall in love with Jesus, right. we'll see sin as the way God sees it. Right. And if we really love Jesus, all the, that might, all, all the, the, the hate of the world and, and the sin that's there will no longer have control over us. We'll be set free. We'll be set free. Do you love Jesus? Yes. Do you love Him tonight? Yes. I wish I could, 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 could place that question uh, upon, on you until it's in your hearts. That you respond with the answer, yes, I love Jesus more than I love life itself. We must visit for Jesus' sake. We must invite for Jesus. We must sacrifice. We must attend services. We must preach. And we must win souls for Jesus' sake. We must have a personal devotion to Jesus. And not just in word, but with all our hearts, right. with all our soul. There must be a passionate devotion that will wake us in the middle of the night. That will be with us in the day. That, that will be upon us at, at every moment, at home or, or wherever we're at. That, that it's, it's Jesus, Jesus, bless Jesus. That must be the cry that comes from our hearts. The second price of a revival is a purposeful compassion for the souls of men. A purposeful compassion for the souls of men. There's compassion and then there's compassion. And compassion, I don't mean that which causes one to weep when a moving story is told. 
I mean the compassion that burns inside. That, that's, that, that burns inside of you, these high uh, uh, flames that, you know what, that these flames just begin to consume you, that on Monday you have even more compassion than you had Sunday. And on Tuesday, the flames dig up and there's even more compassion Tuesday than you had Monday. And Wednesday, there's more compassion than you had today. And each day, the flames begin to stir up inside of you more and more. I mean, the kind of compassion that gives us no rest nor peace until we give the best of our thoughts and the best of our talents and the best of our time and the best of our efforts to seeking out the lost for our Savior. We need a purposeful compassion that will wake us in the morning that we're crying, Oh Lord, save our city. We need compassion that will drive us to our knees and make us say when we go to bed, Lord, for Christ's sake, save our people. We need a compassion that will seek out and make opportunities to witness for Christ day or night. That's purposeful Compassion. And the third price that we must pay for this revival that huh, is persistent intercession. We must not only have personal devotion to Christ, but purposeful compassion for the souls of men, but also huh, constant prayer and intercession. We must pray without ceasing. We must pray as we've never prayed before. And we must pray for each other. Pray for our, chel for our fellow church members. Pray for the backslidden. The unconcerned. Pray for you pastors. Pray for the singers. The musicians. Pray for our cities and our towns. If I were to ask you this question, do you believe God answers prayer? You would immediately say, I sure do. Do you? Yeah. Do you believe God answers prayers? Yeah. How do you know? Has someone told you? Do you know it second hand? Or have you tested it and know it to be a true statement? Has God ever answered prayer for you in a mighty and miraculous way? If you believe the Bible is the Word of God, if you believe the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ, if you believe that there is a God in heaven, if you believe God can give us revival, if you want to see a, a, a visitation of God's Holy Spirit, I challenge you. And more than just challenge you, I appeal to you. I ask you, from this moment on, without rest, let us, all of us, each one, lift our cities to God's throne of grace. Let us keep them there in, in, in the heat of our prayers until God answers by fire and sends us a revival from above. This is God's plan for a revival. Comply with it, and the heavens will flood the earth with showers of blessings. Let us plead God's grace until the Holy Spirit creates within our hearts a burning passion for Christ, a purposeful compassion for souls, and a ceaseless intercession for power and victory.